Well, since there's no objective diagnostic test for a tension headache, a migraine headache, a cluster headache, it's not like giant cell arteritis where we can take a biopsy and actually see something on pathology. So therefore, the diagnostic test is a symptom pattern. A tension headache is the most common, but there's no test to prove it. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. So you have to exclude things like visual disturbance. You see, in a migraine headache, the visual disturbance means that you have flashers and floating lights, flashing lights, floating lights. That's why so many migraines are managed by ophthalmologists. In fact, some migraines are managed exclusively with ophthalmologists, so you have visual disturbance and flashing and floatings and stars. And luminous, yes, yeah, spectra fortificatia, spectra fortificatia. To the 19th century man, it looked like the sun going over a castle in the distance. Very, very poetic, isn't it? Spectra fortificatia. But what do you see in physical exam? You see nothing because the eye actually looks normal, when, even though you have these visual disturbances. Now, that's why the presentation of migraine headache is a symptom pattern and things that make it worse. For instance, people say, oh, I have an aura, an aura, and I also can feel something. I smell something. I know that I'm going to get it when I eat chocolate. I eat chocolate, I get migraine. I eat chocolate with cheese. I eat chocolate and cheese, and I get migraine. I eat chocolate-covered cheese with a migraine. I eat chocolate-covered cheese balls while drinking red wine. I'm eating chocolate-covered cheese balls while drinking red wine during my period, and I have migraines. And overall, the most common cause of provoking it is emotions. A second that emotion. Yes, you're pissing me off. Now I got a migraine. It's your fault. Yep. Emotions bring it on more than all the other things, more than chocolate-covered cheese balls during your period. Become a pot-smoking vegan. <laughs> and you won't have those migraines. So the migraines, are there any physical findings? Only with something a comp complicated migraine. Complicated means that you have such severe vasospasm, it actually causes a permanent neurologic deficit. Ay, ay, ay. So here's the proposed mechanism of what causes migraines. Now, we don't really know this because, first of all, there's no autopsy for it. Second of all, you have to have somebody's skull open to be able to see this. But we think it's vasoconstriction, vasospasm in the brain, followed by vasodilation. In the vasodilation, you get the headache, also known as what's the most common adverse effect of nitroglycerin. Nitrates cause headache because it causes vasodilation, throbbing, throbbing, throbbing. So the treatments also in migraine are to reconstrict the blood vessels, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Or to prevent that vasospasm. Now, when you see frequent, multiple, short, high intensity, now that's not a diagnostic test, it's a symptom pattern. Multiple, frequent, short is cluster headache because the very word means that they're clustering in time. Now the other way that you make a diagnosis of cluster headache is that there's physical findings. You can see something. The eye is red, the eye is tearing, the tearing eye makes stuff come out of your nose. So cluster headache's a symptom pattern and your eye looks bad. Now when there's visual disturbance, and jaw claudication, muscle pain, muscle aches and pains, jaw claudication. Jaw claudication means as you chew, as you chew, it causes your muscles to become sore, the same as you have leg claudication for someone with peripheral arterial disease. So this is vascular insufficiency, giant cell or temporal arteritis, and it's in the same family as polymyalgia rheumatica. So the sed rate will be high, and there'll be a brilliant fast response to steroids. Now, how come in polyarteritis nodosa, when we do the vasculitis section, we're trying to do an angiogram, a GI angiogram, we don't want to do the kidney biopsy? Hmm. And the answer is, is that here you can do the biopsy of the temporal artery because we don't happen to need a temporal artery. I don't need my temporal artery. Why is it there? You don't need it. It's like your sural nerve. You don't need it. That's why in polyarteritis nodosa, you have another vasculitis, we biopsy the sural nerve because nobody likes to biopsy a kidney, a high pressure circumstance, high pressure, pressure of 45 millimeters, almost half a systolic, 45 millimeters, and what ends up happening in that is that if it bleeds, you can't tamp it on it. You can't press it. So biopsy this, but to sural nerve biopsy of polyarteritis nodosa, similar. How come we don't biopsy Takayasu's arteritis? This is an arteritis vasculitis, polyarteritis nodosa vasculitis, 
cerebral nerve biopsy. Ta Takayasu's pulseless disease. We don't biopsy Takayasu's because you'd have to biopsy the subclavian. And nobody likes to cut pieces out of your subclavian, you know? You need a subclavian, you don't need a temple artery. This headache is more common in obese people, oral contraceptives, some sort of pervert who likes to use expired tetracyclines. Vitamin A toxicity was described in the Yukon in the 1840s in the gold rush when people get trapped in the snows of the Yukon in Alaska and they'd eat the sled dog liver and got vitamin A toxicity. Then it looks like a tumor, but when you go, it's got papilledema, but when you go looking inside the brain with the scan, there is no tumor. It's it's pseudotumor cerebri, also known as idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Idiopathic, I don't know why, intracranial hypertension. It look like a brain tumor, but I don't see a brain tumor. High opening pressure. Pseudotumor cerebri is a great name, isn't it? Physical findings. There's no physical findings of tension headaches, and migraine headaches generally have no physical findings unless the rare person who has signs of a stroke, and then you treat it like it's a stroke. Cluster headaches does have an eye that looks bad. So this is a very good question for you, isn't it? Because you have to answer your questions based on an IQ test. Which of these is different from the other four? Which of these is different from the other five? And you say, well, what's the only question? Since the only one that has physical findings is cluster headache, red, tearing, not tearing. And the tearing makes it go down your nose and here it's the bit thing. Meiosis, anhydrosis, mitosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, tosis, meiosis, anhydrosis. It, the question will say, which of these types of headache is most likely to have Horner syndrome? Cluster headache. Which of these is most likely to be a man? Cluster headache. Which of these is most likely to have aura? Migraine. Which of these is most likely to be brought on by emotions? Migraine. Which of these is most likely to cause permanent visual disturbance? Too easy, too easy, temporal arteritis. Which of these is most likely to need biopsy? Temporal arteritis. Which of these is most likely to respond to diuretics? Acetazolamide, acetazolamide. Pseudotumor cerebri is most likely to, di di to respond to diuretics? Acetazolamide. Which of these is most likely to respond to surgery? Pseudotumor cerebri. Which of these is most likely to have papilledema? So if you want to get the questions right, you have to think like the fish do, and the fish goes like this. Don't just tell me the headache, man. Tell me which one of these is different. What's different from the other four? Then that's how I memorize the answers. So this whole course and our whole book is in that pattern. What's different from the others so you don't have to keep memorizing? For instance, what's different about pseudotumor or idiopathic intracranial hypertension? What's different about idiopathic intracranial hypertension from the others? It's the only one with a six nerve palsy. The abductors, abducens, abducens. Yeah, my head hurts. Bang, abducens. God, I feel like somebody's ripping my head off. You're abducting me. Yes. I just made that up. Now, the abducens palsy, also the other question. Hmm, which of these is most likely to have visual field defects, deficits? Ooh, now for the medical student, you're like, mm, uh, temporal arteritis has visual field. Actually, no. Temporal arteritis actually makes you outright go blind in the whole eye. Temporal arteritis, giant cell arteritis, doesn't just take out pieces of visual fields. Pseudotumor does. So you do it on uh, a visual field testing and it's just pieces of an individual eye's visual field. Why is it abducens palsy? People can make up stuff and say, well, it's the longest cranial nerve. It's like, eh, we don't know. We don't know. It's a headache in a red eye. The headache in the red eye. No trauma, no discharge. The reason for no trauma is we'll do in the opto section. The reason for, head, for no trauma is that's abrasion. Abrasion, don't patch, gets better on its own. No discharge, that'd be conjunctivitis. No photophobia, so therefore say it's not, not, not. Now, again, this is step two ophthalmology. And step two ophthalmology is this, red eye. Step two ophthalmology can also be called, when do you know you have to refer? Oh, you know, uh, I, uh, uh, no trauma. I don't need a referral for an abrasion. Patch, no patch, abrasions, it sucks, it feels terrible. But the main thing is uh, uh, that don't use steroids and it gets better on its own. Discharge, conjunctivitis. You don't need to consult opto on Saturday night 
for a discharge for conjunctivitis. Photophobia, uveitis. Oh, 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 ding, 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 ding. You better know that this is the one that has to be if there was photophobia. So let's review this. There, if there is trauma, you don't need an ophthalmologist. If there is discharge, you don't need an ophthalmologist conjunctivitis. If there is photophobia, you better get an ophthalmologist. It's uveitis. That's why you have this iritis, uveitis. You'll go blind from iritis. Ooh, and how will you know? If there's a fixed, mid-dilated, non-reactive fixed, mid-dilated pupil, mid-dilated but not moving, it's forming synechiae, Senechiae. Your mother was a loafer and your father was a senechiae. What's a senechiae? That's a fancy word for the iris getting stuck to the inner part of the eye. And that's glaucoma. Acute glaucoma, angle closure glaucoma. That's an opto-emergency. So uveitis with photophobia, opto-emergency. Glaucoma, opto-emergency. So tension, migraine, diagnostic, None of them. There's no specific test for any of those. CT, if, they're, if it's the first time, if it, you're the, having these headaches and it's the first time you've ever had it, if it's a sudden overwhelming, because you're really trying to uh, rule out intracranial bleeding, you're trying to rule out if it's sudden overwhelming, sudden overwhelming and new, sudden overwhelming and new, you're scanning to exclude bleeding and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Pseudotumor cerebri does have a test. You've got to exclude the mass with the scan. And then lumbar puncture shows a high pressure, and you've got to know that so you can start treatment. Weight loss acetazolamide. When we say CSF normal, we mean the fluid itself is normal. The pressure is high, but there's no white cells, no protein. There's nothing on the, the examination of the fluid. GCA is a giant cell arteritis, and that's a sed rate and a biopsy. Start steroids, and the question, of course, is don't wait for the results of biopsy. Start the steroids and don't wait for the biopsy. You didn't need me that one. You knew that one. So tension headaches, uh, so I'm going to tell you what they're going to, the most likely tension headache question is don't use opiates. Yo, what happened? No, doc, I got terrible tension headaches. Can I have some Vicodin? Uh, I'll take uh, 10 Q2. Yeah, that's right. So you're supposed to use um, uh, things that are not quite opiates to control the pain. Uh, migraines, uh, we talk about triptans and ergotamine, and I, I just, I can't remember the last time I saw somebody actually use ergotamine, but ergotamine and triptans do the same thing. They're abortive, they reconstrict the blood vessels. Um, so your test is basically the want you know on migraines, um, that there's no physical finding, and the basic thing to know is that triptans and ergotamine, abortive, not preventive, beta blockers, calcium blockers, SSRIs, anti-epileptic drugs are preventive. And that's your question, to know abortive versus preventive. If you're a more advanced person and you're trying to get your 245, 255, 260, you're supposed to know that don't give triptans to people who have coronary disease, severe hypertension, pregnant, coronary severe hypertension or pregnant, because these will constrict and makes the baby come out, squishes that baby. Hypertension goes up, squishes that blood person. So what are the contraindications? The contraindications are things where vasoconstriction is bad for you. So you are abort clusters with triptans or ergotamines as well. Uh, the thing about the 100% oxygen, because there's a QBank question running around out there where it made it look like 100% oxygen is the first choice for abortive therapy. And the answer is the first choice if you have a contraindication to triptans. It is effective, but on a, on a use level, how are you going to instantly get 100% oxygen? Just going down to local CBS and getting yourself a hyperbaric chamber and a couple of oxygen tanks? So you can be in and out of a pharmacy in 20 minutes with your triptan or ergotamine. You can't be in and out of your pharmacy in 20 minutes for 100% oxygen. Where it is definitely first is when you can't give the triptans. And arteritis with prednisone? and where you can't give them, hypertension, pregnant, cornered, anything in which vasoconstriction is bad. Pseudotumor, uh, we don't know why obesity causes pseudotumor. Why do you get uh, papilledema and high intracranial pressure? Unknown, but weight loss helps. Acetazolamide, why? Because carbonic anhydrase, uh, uh, carbonic anhydrase is what makes your cerebral spinal fluid. Oh, yes, that's right. It makes your and make also makes your intraocular fluid too. It makes your intraocular fluid, and repeat LPs to pull the fluid off. Now, VP shunt is that. What happens if it doesn't work? What happens if you give these meds or you do the weight loss and it doesn't work? 
then you can either put a physical shunt from your brain to your guts, or do you know the Italian word? What's the Italian, what's the Italian word for a window? It's a finestra. You put a window in their optic nerve and actually drains the fluid out their optic nerve into their eyeballs. Your abort clusters in migraine the same way with their gotamine or triptans or 100% for oxygens only for the cluster headaches, but here's something extra for abortive therapy and preventive for clusters. Steroids and lithium are second and third line agents for cluster headaches, not for migraines to try and abort the cluster headaches. The biggest, the main cluster headaches, the main cluster headaches uh, that, that's preventive, the main cluster headache preventive is verapamil. So you now have one specific thing to memorize. Gee, isn't that easier than just to, mm. prophylactic. First of all, if I had one migraine a month, I would take prophylactic medications all the time. But the American Academy of Sadists, uh, neurologists, say, oh, doc, I'm having a migraine. Yeah, come back. You don't have enough. Come back. I'm having one every two weeks. Oh, no. Oh, but I'm seeing the bright flashing lights. It's not enough. So basically, the rules are, so to speak, guidelines, three or more use prophylactic therapy. The best initial prophylactic therapy 20 years ago was non-specific beta blockers. It's non-specific beta blockers now. Propranolol doesn't have a lot of specific uses. Uh, essential tremor, essential tremor, uh, thyroid storm, essential tremor, thyroid storm. Not a lot of specific things for non-specific beta blockers. Calcium blockers do work for migraine as well. So what's the whole point? The whole point that we think is that migraines is vasospasm, vasodilation, headache. So use things that interrupt that vasospastic cycle. Tricyclic antidepressants. If tricyclics were invented now, we wouldn't call them tricyclic antidepressants. We'd call them tricyclic analgesics because they relieve pain. <gasps> Peripheral neuropathy. <gasps> Ooh, yes, tricyclic analgesic, SSRIs. Why? Because they do. So what are you supposed to do then if propranolol and calcium blockers, how are you supposed to know which one to go to next? Well, just like seizure medications, we know what's first, levetiracetam. What do you do later? Couldn't tell you. There's no specific answer you, because just like in peripheral neuropathy, they don't work in everybody, and you don't know which one is going to work until you find the one that you try. It actually helps. So tropiramate and lamotrigine, a lot of the seizure medications end up being good for neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain means peripheral neuropathy and headaches. Botox shots in your head, Botox shots in the head. Relieve the pain. Botox shots, so the clusters are okay, the, the clusters are in short bursts, and the prophylactic takes months to work. Wow, verapamil, trigeminal neuralgia. Again, what causes it? Don't know. Ooh, again, headaches. Don't know what ha the, what the, the uh, prophylactic. Pr the best initial prophylactic didn't work. Propranolol. What else do you try? Lamotrigine, um, uh, uh, topiramate, uh, phenytoin, carbamazepine, antiepileptics, or neuropathic pain drugs. Epileptics. Same with trigeminal neuralgia. Entirely a sensory disturbance, a sensory disturbance on your face. But what's different about this than other sorts of neuropathies? Different predisposing factors, different provokers, different provocateurs. Chewing, touching, hitting the back of the teeth, people a little lightly tapping, and all of a sudden, I, there was a um, uh, high school teacher and, uh, that was a patient that. Um, he had cluster, uh, excuse me, trigeminal neuralgia. And he was in front of the class one day and he said, I'm not gonna let this pain make me timid. And he felt like he had a knife stuck in his face and he crashed to the ground with overwhelming pain as if he'd been s stabbed. Because the word timid, if you're a phonating person or a, a linguist, or uh, a speech and swallow person, the word uh, uh, timid, the T sound, the, t the tongue hits the back of the teeth. And when the tongue hit the back of the teeth, it provoked his trigeminal neuralgia and he went down to the ground. So what's different about trigeminal neuralgia is the provoking agents, even the lightest touch of a face, 
It's kind of like what used to be called reflex sympathetic dystrophy, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which is basically you have some trauma to a peripheral nerve and all of a sudden it provokes the most intense pain. What else is different? Carbamazepine is the best initial therapy. Again, you notice anti-epileptic medications, anti-epileptic drugs acting as neuropathic pain drugs. Now, baclofen, when's the other time you see baclofen? That's for spasticity in multiple sclerosis and ALS. Lamotrigine, anti-epileptic drugs are neuropathic pain drugs. So, migraine headaches, the initial preventive medication doesn't work, try a bunch of anti-epileptic drugs, uh, tricyclics. What are you gonna do for peripheral neuropathy, diabetic neuropathy? Well, we have a, a lamotrigine, we have gabapentin, pregabalin, gabapentin, pregabalin, which are anti-epileptic drugs. What happens if the gabapentin pre and pregabalin don't work for diabetic neuropathy? Try a bunch of anti-epileptic drugs. But now we have something again, what's different about trigeminal neuralgia besides the carbamazepine? You actually can do surgery. So some people have a blood vessel that's pressing on the facial, uh, excuse me, the fifth cranial nerve on the trigeminal. That's pressing on the nerve as it's coming out with the facial nerve, they travel in the same canal, and you have to cut it or decompress it. But you see, if I cut it, then I won't feel my face. Well, yeah, but it's better than having unrelenting pain, feeling like you've been stabbed in the face. post herbetic neuralgia. Tricyclic antidepressants, pregabalin, gabapentin, topiramate, lamotrigine, until you find one that works. Will you be asked to choose between tricyclic, what would they be called? Analgesics, amitriptyline, and pregabalin and gabapentin? No, because they're all okay. This is basically the, the, the uh, varicella zoster, the varicella zoster, the shingles virus, the same one that causes chicken pox in a kid, goes into the blood vessels, into the nerves and hides there and reactivates. Why does it reactivate? Immunosuppression or aging? 5% of people over the age of 60 will get a zoster at some point. And the same way that you treat herpes simplex, famcyclovir, valacyclovir, acyclovir, famcyclovir, valacyclovir are all equal. And the whole, one of the major points in treating, because you will go, uh, go away on its own, is to prevent posterpetic neuralgia. Do steroids help? They don't. We wanted them to, but they don't help. Steroids, they don't prevent posterpetic neuralgia. The pain is treated with tricyclic antidepressants, like amitriptyline nortriptyline, anitriptyline, gabapentin, pregamblin, which are also seizure medication. Look at that, anti-epileptic drugs for neuropathic pain. Diabetic peripheral neuropathy, we would say exactly the same thing. Posterpetic neuropathy, same thing. Ah, now here's what's different. The peripheral neuropathy is not trigeminal, but the peripheral neuropathy is like zoster, like shingles pain, or diabetics, Topical capsaicin, substance P mediator, substance P drug, substance P pain, pain, while waiting for the other anti-epileptics to have some benefit. Unfortunately, the answer for, tri for neuropathic pain is none of them is gonna uh, work more than half of patients have. They reduce to about a 50% reduction in pain to about 50 or 70% of the patients. Now, this is basically basically putting Novocaine on your, on, your, on your skin, topical lidocaine. It helps, it just makes it numb. So there's no routinely effective medication for any of the forms of peripheral neuropathy, and that's why we end up getting down to capsaicin, topical lidocaine, until you find something that works. And unlike trigeminal neuralgia, we don't have, we don't have a surgical way to fix this. Peripheral neuropathy of diabetics. We don't have a way to fix it with surgery because it's not one nerve. Postherpetic neuralgia. Not really a nerve way to cut the pain because you can't slice it out. Now, you could prevent this or a zoster by the zoster vaccine. This is a biggie. 5% of people above the age of 60. So um, the uh, cutoff from when you give the vaccine, and remember, vaccine criteria could change anytime. 
and you must always try to answer the, be- the closest to what's right at that time. So as recently this past week, um, I had people saying to me, you know, I knew that a guideline changed just a month before I took the test. And I considered myself a pretty current person, said the internal medicine resident. This is for internal medicine boards. And the guy said, the Zoster vaccine used to be give it above 60, but I knew that when I took my test, it had changed to 50 the month before. And I was like, maybe I should answer 60 and be wrong, because when the question was written, the cutoff was 60. Well, pap smear guidelines. You know, when I was in medical school, it was age of 18 or uh, recent sexual activity. No, it's 21 to 65. Uh, it used to be every year for the first three years. No, it's every three years until the age of 30. So guidelines changed. What do you do? You do the best you can on that day. And, uh, you know, uh, so why is it different? I thought babies got vaccinated with uh, varicella vaccine. They do to prevent chicken pox. But this is to prevent reactivation. Age 50. Oh, what makes you goofy? So the difference between uh, uh, dementia, memory loss, delirium and stupor, <laughs> obtundent, lethargic. What's the difference between delirium, stupor, obtundation, lethargy, altered mental status, change in mental status? Whatever way you learn to say, he no think so good. Well, they're about the same. They're used pretty much interchangeably. Anybody who says they're really different is just making it up. And what that means is, you see, right now, right now, I could have no memory. Maybe I'm just reading off a teleprompter. Though three quarters of the words I'm using are not on the teleprompter. Maybe I'm reading off a teleprompter and I'm demented. We once had a president like that. It's pretty charming, though. Well, delirium is that you're not awake enough to read, to discuss, to interact, to follow commands. And also the things that do it are different. For instance, does potassium cause stupor? No. Potassium, high potassium, cardiac. Low potassium, cardiac. Hyperkalemic cardiac, hypokalemic cardiac. No. But sodium is a CNS. A high sodium, CNS problems. Low sodium, CNS problems. A sodium is a CNS. Oxygen, hypoxia causes you to have altered mental steps. Hypoglycemia, for sure, you don't need to go to medical school for that one, or any CNS infection. Meningitis, encephalitis, or abscess, all cause any CNS anatomy evil, meaning you can say, oh, stroke, or tumor, or subdural, or epidural, oh, uh, yeah, 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 any, anything. Renal failure, uh, accumulating nitrogenous waste products, the same thing, liver failure. Renal and liver failure, say, the, the garbage picks up. So the carpus builds up. So all of these are the causes of altered mental status. What's not there? Chloride, what's not there? Potassium, what's not there? Copper and iron, they don't change your mental status. So withdrawal or toxicity from alcohol, barbiturates, and benzos because your neurons See alcohol, barbiturates, and benzos very similar. Uh, whether they inc- open up chloride channels and they make the membrane more negative, there's a step one USMLE part of my brain, uh, physiology professor Conrad. And so withdrawal or toxicity of these. So the point about this is, all of these are the causes of altered mental status. Even rarely, low magnesium. But what are they also the cause of? Seizures. What's the worst form of altered mental status? A seizure. The same way, what's the worst form of coronary disease? Myocardial infarction. So don't be memorizing these twice. Sodium, seizure, altered mental status, confused. High sodium, low sodium, low glucose, low oxygen, high calcium. All of these are the cause of altered mental status. They're also all the causes of seizures. So when someone comes in and they're seizing or having altered mental status without even thinking, it's sodium, glucose, calcium, oxygen, CT, sodium, glucose, calcium, oxygen, CT, sodium, glucose, calcium, oxygen, CT, before you do any other tests, because if all these tests are negative and you scan the head as normal, then it's epilepsy if it's a seizure. It's epilepsy. It's not epilepsy if you've got hypoglycemia and you have a seizure. 
It's not epilepsy if you're hypoxic. It's not epilepsy if you've got hepatic failure. It's epilepsy if all those tests are negative, including the scans, then you get a EEG. So seizures of uncalled, unclear etiology or epilepsy, that's when you get the EEG. It's, if there's a clear cause, it's not epilepsy. It's called hypoglycemia. For acute seizures, status epilepticus, besides correcting the cause, right? For instance, what if you're seizing from low glucose? You get glucose, but we're talking about seizures not from hypoxia, hypoglycemia, hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia causes seizures. Hypercalcium causes lethargy confusion. So for acute status epilepticus, this is the only thing that's really clear. Benzodiazepines is first. Now, I could say it's lorazepam, which you know is Ativan, which doesn't really matter. The question on your, that you're getting, see, this is one of the confusing things for people. You go saying, man, I'm expecting to see lorazepam, and they don't put lorazepam, they put temazepam, diazepam, any pam. Whichever one, benzodiazepines, IV repeatedly, what's the dose? They don't ask dosing on step two. And if you're still seizing, phenytoin. Well, actually, we don't really use phenytoin. We use something called phosphenytoin. And phosphenytoin is, in fact, phenytoin. It's phenytoin that just is a phos. What does it mean? It means that inside the body, it's metabolized and turned quickly into phenytoin. So what's the difference? Phosphenytoin does not cause the toxicities of phenytoin. Remember, phenytoin is a class one B, antiarrhythmic. Mm. Phenytoin is in the same class as lidocaine, pookies. It's in the same class as lidocaine. So therefore, it's an antiarrhythmic. Phenytoin by itself causes hypotension, AV block, hypotension, AV block, hypotension, 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 AV block. So phosphenytoin doesn't cause those toxicities. So therefore, you can give it much faster. Phosphenytoin? Is there any time you can give IV faster? <laughs> Phenobarbital. I haven't gotten down there for years, but I, we actually used to do that. Okay, If somebody really persisted after benzos and phenytoin, you'd give them phenobarbital. Now, ultimately, if you've given a benzo and phenytoin and phenobarb. So, remember what I said? The biggest, clearest question is the adverse effects. Dosing. No. Name brand. No. Antiarrhythmic, for the, uh, anti-epileptic for the long term. Levetiracetam, which is Kepra, uh, for, um, because it doesn't have many side effects. Well, what's number two and three for anti-epileptic? There's no answer. But I know that phenytoin gives hypotension, AV block, hypotension, AV block. Oh, adverse effects are a clear answer, aren't they? What's the second and third drug? Phenytoin causes gingival hyperplasia. Now, if you continue to have a seizure despite these drugs, vecuronium, pancuronium, vecuronium, vancuronium, tubal curare, get a person over there with a blow dart, ah, <coughs> stop seizing, doesn't really stop the seizure, does it? Neuromuscular blockers, succinylcholine, vecuronium, pancuronium, don't stop the seizure. They just take you from the and ah, relax you so you can intubate them, but you have to use general anesthesia after that to stop the seizure. mid propofol, intubate, use general anesthesia. The neuromuscular blockers only block contraction. If you give, and this, by the way, is your level of question. Oh, what's the best long-term anti-epileptic after, after levetiracetam? I don't know. But I do know that if I use a neuromuscular blocker and I don't give extra medications like midazolam, propofol, other general anesthesia to stop the seizure, their muscles look relaxed. Meanwhile, they're cooking on the inside, making chicharrones de mente, making brain pakoras, making shawarma brain kebab. Because neuromuscular blockers don't stop the seizure, they just stop the external muscular contractions. The types of seizures. Let's do the gel. Now, there's a lot of seizure disorders, and I ain't going in them. Because I don't think it's your level of question. And the other thing is all the small, oh, Lennox Gaston, oh, did it. Uh, 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 uh. For me, it's like learning all the difference 
between uh, the different uh, posterior circulation twigs. Uh, let's see, see if we can just get the basics. A partial seizure is like the word means. One part of the body is seizing and it's not generalized. One part of the body is seizing and it's not generalized. Now, when we say generalized seizure, generalized seizure does not mean that you've lost consciousness. That means complex. Generalized means it's not in one body part. A simple seizure means that you're awake. You mean you can just have a... Yeah, you could say to people, hey, listen, why did you smack me in the head? Oh, no, it's, it wasn't me. I'm, I'm having a simple partial seizure. No, you're not. You're hitting me in the face. Oh, no, I didn't take my, I didn't take my Levitrace at him today. You're just hitting me. Maybe. <laughs> Complex means you have lost consciousness. Now, tonic-clonic means that you have alternating periods of generalized seizure, alternating periods of muscular rigidity and muscular contraction. Muscular rigidity and muscular contraction. Tonic and clonic. Tonic and clonic. Tonic and clonic. Oh, it's just a little bad. Oh, as opposed to this, which is the big bad, the grand mal. So, uh, absent seizures, is uh, that's another good one. You're uh, out there or in a long-term relationship or a short-term relationship you don't particularly like. And somebody's talking to you and they're going, you never pay attention to me. And you go, it's not you. It's my absence seizures. I didn't take my, I didn't take my ethosuximide. I didn't take my ethosuximide. So, Status epilepticus treatment has been the same for a long time. It's the only truly clear thing. Benzodiazepines first, IV. Phosphenitoin, which can give faster, faster. It's not why it's called FOS, but it works. So you don't get the hypotension AV block, hypotension AV block. Phenobarb, then general anesthesia. You wouldn't use something like propofol unless you could intubate. You wouldn't use propofol, for instance, as like a sleeping medication at home. Mm. Anti-epileptic drugs, the long-term drugs. Now, this, uh, you, uh, uh, you just have to accept that there's no clear answer. Besides that, we're going to say, oh, we're in general going to use levetiracetam, okay? Oh, levetiracetam first. Now, the bigger question for you is not so much the choice of the drug. We say lamotrigine and levetiracetam first often simply because they have less adverse effects. The biggest question for you besides knowing that sodium glucose, oxygen, abnormalities, and, and CT, liver and renal failure, that ain't epilepsy. It's to know whether you should be treated with the first seizure. This is the must-know one. So you don't treat a first seizure because a lot of the times they don't recur, particularly in adults. Second, a lot of times we're never clear whether it actually was a seizure. So what's first? You didn't, come, you didn't stop your seizure until we gave you medications to stop your seizure. We didn't stop your seizure till we gave you benzodiazepines or phenytoin to stop your seizure. Oh, you're going to recur. You're going to recur. Or you've got an uncorrectable thing on your scan. We have to give you medications because you're going to recur. Femal history, you're going to recur. So all of these are indications that you're going to recur. Now, therefore, so we don't wait for them to recur. The other thing is, why did we do the EEG in the first place for people who have seizures? Because people who have an abnormal EEG are going to recur. For many years, there was no answer to this question about what was the best uh, anti-epileptic in pregnancy. The answer is levetiracetam or lamotrigine because they have the fewest side effects. Also, if a lot of this stuff uh, looks new to you, because the point of this course is that this one is rather complete. If you look at all the videos, it's going to have everything that you need. The book, everything you need. The book is more expanded, more beautiful than ever. And so am I. It is um, also so that you can go look stuff up. For instance, uh, maybe there are certain medications that you haven't heard of in here. It's time to go look them up and make a list of things to look up. Choices. Well, treatment of status is clear. Benzophosphenitoin. 
Treatment of long terms, not so clear. Levotracetum, why? Because it's got the fewest adverse effects. Phenytoin, effective, and most people don't have adverse effects. Valproic acid, the clear question is, it's effective, and the clear question is dangerous in pregnancy because it screws around with folic acid. Ah, you see, there's a clear question. Adverse effects is a clear question. Valproic acid screws around with your folic acid, valproic acid. Okay, gabapentin, also per peripheral neuropathy. Topiramate, also per peripheral neuropathy. Lamotrigine, also per peripheral neuropathy. Wait a second, that's not one clear drug. You just gave me seven drugs. Yep, as they say in Russia, Tavshitsky. All right, ethosuximide is best for? Absent seizures, petit mal, if not controlled. Now, what are you going to do in general, not just absent seizures, but in general for epilepsy? if it's not controlled by a single drug. In general, in epilepsy, first you check the level for things that have levels. Ah, they're therapeutic and they're still not controlled. That's a breakthrough seizure. If somebody's not compliant and their blood level of the drug is low, that's not a breakthrough seizure. It's being deficient. It's being deficient. You don't put gas in car, car stop. It's not a defect in the car. You didn't put the gas in the car. But if, what if somebody is on a med at the therapeutic level and they're not controlled, then you switch to a different drug. Not add a second drug. You switch to a separate drug, a new drug. Now you switch to a separate drug, and if they're still not controlled, then you add a second drug. So you get that? Switch first, add later. Switch first, add later. Switch first, add later. If multiple meds, ultimately what can you do to control seizures? You actually can do surgery. You can cut out a seizure focus. You can make a slice so it can't propagate. So if you have a twitching in your brain, it can't propagate, can't disseminate, can't make you generalized in your seizures. In pregnancy, these two drugs, levotracetam, lamotrigine. Now, which of the seizure drugs gives you hyponatremia? So what you see I'm trying to do here is now we have to take a test. And for a test, it's not good enough to just say, yeah, well, you know, they're all okay or they're all not okay. You have to say, no, tell me the questions, fish. All right, the pregnancy one is a clear question. Hyponatremia with carbamazepin is a clear question. Oral contraceptives actually inactivate lamotrigine? They do, because they increase the metabolism of lamotrigine so that it goes below a therapeutic level. So all contraceptives will inactivate lamotrigine and you can see it's because it makes it get to a sub-therapeutic level. Now, HLA, now remember in for a back of ear in HIV, a back of ear, you have to test for HLA B, 5701, HLA B5701, to know that it's safe to use a back of ear. Ah, so now we have to test for a B1502 to tell you if you're going to have a skin reaction with carbamazepine and phenytoin. Oh, HIV B5701 to tell if you're going to have a skin reaction to a back of ear. This tells you skin reaction with some of the anti-epileptics. See, isn't that a clear question? When to stop anti-epileptics if you have stopped having seizures? Not so clear. These questions, adverse effect questions, are clear. Which second anti-epileptic to use? <laughs> you stop, and now this is just a matter of a definition. We could have said 18 months, could have said 24, could have said 36 with no seizures. Now, not so clear. Adverse effects are clear. All right, how do you tell someone's going to have a seizure? Turns out that if you deprive people of sleep and they have any predisposition to having a seizure, they're going to seize or have an abnormal EEG. That's why sleep deprivation is, as they say, an enhanced interrogation technique. <laughs> nice word. Yeah. <laughs> 38-year-old man with seizures, partial control with the second drug, which means it's going to break through. Uh, this next question is probably the only a really hard one because with the anti-epileptics, after I tell you to use levotracetum as the first drug, uh, uh, if you're 
pragmatic, meaning you just want to get the answers right, you go, well, Fisher told me there's no clear second drug. Done. There's no clear second drug. He told me to know the adverse effects. Done. Now, the driving issue is very hard for people because people want to answer based on what they think ought to be done. I ought to be able to confiscate his license. I ought to be able to put it on his license. He's got a seizure disorder. I ought to be able to uh, impound them and prevent them from driving. It, it should be like TB lockup. Now, what's one of the biggest differences is that in tuberculosis, the people you're in contact with are not consenting to be near you. Technically speaking, if you're driving, you're consenting to be on the road and crazy people can crash. So in these, which is, this is a medical, legal, or an ethics question, you don't have to agree with it. You can say, morally, I think it's like child abuse. I should be able to prevent them from leaving the office. I should be able to confiscate his license. I should be able to report to motor vehicles. And I agree with you. The answer is, you don't have that right because it's called US MLE, not the California MLE, or the Michigan MLE, or the Guam MLE, US territory, or the Puerto Rican MLE, or the uh, 8,000 people in India a year who take US MLE and don't intend to ever actually come here to practice. A whole bunch of people just take it because they take it. Uh, and it's the answer. You don't have the right to confiscate it. And so this is an ethics and legal question. Find another way to get to work. I know, I don't like it either. Neurology is going to be great with us because neurology is going to be filled with very concrete things. Always, never. Stroke, always get the head CT. Never give heparin. And so neurology is a really great subject for board prep because you don't have to agree with everything, you just have to do what I tell you. It's not like um, nephrology. Nephrology. Hey, knock Sean Line Purpura. Steroids don't work. But if the creatinine gets work, gives the steroids. IJ nephropathy. There's no treatment. But if there's proteinuria, it gives steroids and ACE inhibitors. It's not like that. Very concrete. Myasthenia gravis. Antiacetylcholine receptor antibodies first, always combining IVIG and plasmapheresis, combining IVIG and plasmapheresis, never. Good, huh? Yeah, I like it.